it's a little intimidating to be interviewing one of the best interviewers on television. And Ben Mankiewicz has interviewed an incredible array of movie stars and directors and politicians. And actually next year will mark Ben's 20th year as primetime host of Turner Classic Movies and host of TCM's wonderful podcast series, The Plot Thickens, season three, about Lucy, uh, Ricardo Ball <laughs> just finished and I actually loved it. And full disclosure, I had the pleasure of working with Ben on season two of The Plot Thickens and really got to see firsthand how brilliant he is at what he does. Hi, Ben, <laughs> glad to see you. <laughs> Hi, it's uh... I'm glad to see you too. Uh, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. What I'm not good at is uh, Eastern time and uh, Pacific time. Uh, I was like, oh, we talk about those things at 1230. Uh, <laughs> I know we've had that. We, we have had that problem. So, uh, but I'm glad I was close to home. So, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm wearing a sweatshirt, but uh, yeah, you'll be okay. Anyway. I think you looked the way you looked when you first started being the host on TCM. Didn't you used to show up in a hoodie? No, that is not true. But I did, I did, I did underdress. It was funny. I was on a a, a, a radio show last night, uh, overnight show at the WABC in New York, and and the host was like, "Your wardrobe has really changed a lot <laughs> over the years." He was he was very interested in uh, in uh, in discussing my wardrobe. But yeah, and it has changed, but not quite a not quite a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> I like the hoodie. It looks great. Um, so I see the Citizen Kane poster right behind you. And um, I think what would be a great place to start with is your family. All of us are products of our families one way or the other, but your family is a highly unusual one. You had the most prominent people in Hollywood and Washington, DC, and you yourself have, I think, felt the twin poles of show business and politics, at least as a, as a journalist. And so I, I think just, I think a lot of people watching today probably know somewhat of your background, but it'd be great for you to just tell us a little bit about your, the Mankiewicz lineage. Sure. Well, my uh, grandfather, uh, Herman Mankiewicz, uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, this movie, Citizen Kane. We had uh, you in Sharpie. It says screenplay by Herman J. Mankiewicz above Citizen Kane. I don't know whether that's visible here on the uh, on the Zoom. But uh, uh, and then there was, you know, a fight about credit for the movie, which um, famously takes away the fact that it's definitely Orson Welles's movie. It's just, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of the screenplay written by my grandfather. He was very proud of that movie. He was not proud to be a screenwriter, embarrassed by it. Uh, those of you who've seen uh, the Netflix film Mank sort of get, get, uh, got, a, a, I think, a pretty accurate sense of the self-loathing that went on in Herman's head uh, about being a screenwriter, you know, theater critic, uh, journalist, uh, writer, and a novelist, you know, uh, those were uh, noble professions. Uh, even writing a theater would have been, but a theater critic or writing plays, uh, that was okay. But uh, this uh, popcorn movie entertainment that was uh, shameful in his mind. And, you know, if I could go back in time, what you want to do is, you know, scream at him for that. Like, what, what do you, you know, you're, but anyway, he recognized that when he wrote Citizen Kane that he'd written something great. Um, uh, his brother, Joe Mankiewicz, a uh, younger brother, 12 years, far more successful, far more adept at, at managing Hollywood, even though he sort of felt the same way about the movies, but he never thought himself that's never that's never the, the the landline is never an interesting call um and uh a joe mankiewicz uh, won uh, four oscars in two years uh, writing and directing that'll never happen again 49 you know letter of all about eve and, and letter to three wives uh the way around and for those movies and then my dad though wasn't interested in that and my father frank mankiewicz uh, uh became a lawyer and then you heard uh, President Kennedy's you know, sort of call to service. He was an entertainment lawyer and he hated that too. And he, uh, he uh, got in touch with Robert McNamara's office, secretary of defense, which eventually led to Sergeant Shriver offering a job in the Peace Corps. And he was a Peruvian director of the Peace Corps. And then the first Latin American director of the Peace Corps. And then um, were, met Bobby Kennedy while in the Peace Corps and then became Bobby Kennedy's press secretary. And, uh, 
uh, and then George McGovern's campaign manager and president of national public radio and, and had a very different life, a life that, so I grew up in DC really uh, aware of my family's Hollywood lineage, but uh, I, I mean, not caring is not the right word. It was, I was just indifferent. It didn't matter. Like my dad was such a big deal and I idolized my father so much. He was always the smartest guy in every room that I, you know, it was like, oh yeah. And I guess his father wrote movies, but it just didn't matter. And then, then my career sort of changed <laughs> because of uh, that. But anyway, it was, uh, 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 but I, my brother is a uh, reporter, correspondent for uh, Dateline NBC. My cousin, uh, Nick Davis, uh, also Herman Mankiewicz's grandson just wrote a book about Herman and Joe called Competing with Idiots that uh, won an LA Times book prize. And so, uh, and then the movie Mank, it's, you know, it's been a nice year to be a, a, a nice couple of years to be a Mankiewicz. The, pan the pandemic was good to the Mankiewicz. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking, oh my God, do you think that your father's decision to not go into show business was directly related to his own father's I mean, more than ambivalence, you know, real struggle with it. Yeah, I, I think not not directly, because my dad certainly didn't share the same uh, contempt and he would have wanted his father also to recognize his his brilliant. My dad was a big defender of his father um, and, and while acknowledging that he wasn't always a, a great father, although not in a classic sense. I mean, he, he drank a lot, but like he wasn't you know, he was not abusive. He was just he would sleep you know, uh, and he wasn't home a lot, but when he was home, he was, he, he, my father would always say he was great. It was fun and, you know, loved telling stories and hearing stories, but uh, in, in here's why it caused my dad not to go into the, the business is that the business was sort of treated as silly in the family in a, in a way that, that what nobody ever talked about what movie was getting made at Fox or what, what, uh, what Jack Warner was doing or what Harry Cohn was doing at Columbia or what was happening at Paramount. It, what they talked about were, you know, uh, and throughout the 1930s were, you know, the, the impending war in Europe and, and, and Roosevelt and local politics, national politics, literature. They cared about things. So my dad never grew up, even though he was in for a time, Herman was the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood. It was a brief amount of time because he like would have instantly, you know, bet $15,000 on a horse like that day. Um Herman didn't care about money, lent it out, lost it, never really mattered to him. Um, and uh, they, uh, they had to leave their house in Beverly Hills uh, at least a couple of times to rent an apartment on Olympic Boulevard so that the kids could stay in the school district and they'd rent the house out and because Herman ran out of money. Um, so, uh, so it was just never important to my dad and the family. So Herman would have been, en was enormously proud that he didn't go into it, I suspect. Um, uh, although his older, uh, his oldest son, my, my uncle Don, my father's older brother, did go into the business and became a, uh, a screenwriter, and and many and his kids are screenwriters, and you know, um, so yeah, that definitely uh, Herman would would have been delighted by my father's uh, success in 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 journalism and 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 democratic politics. Interesting, and you know, I know you have a journalism degree, right? From Columbia. yeah, from from Columbia, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you worked as a news journalism, a journalist for a while before you turned to the film world. And I'm just, it's so interesting because of your family's sort of interesting relationship with Hollywood, both the huge success, the ambivalence, your father then going in a completely different, or maybe not completely different, but a different direction. Right, right. Um, so what was it that made you go West, young man, I guess? I sort of always thought I'd live in California. I did. I mean, I, I, you know, I, you know, my, my, you know, I, I, very, I had a lovely relationship with my father and, and uh, I know quite idolized him and still do. And, um, you know, he had plenty of flaws, but he was a really, really decent guy loved and, and, and cared about people and, and, and was a good dad. And, uh, but he was, he was the smartest person to every person I knew. And every person who came into contact with our lives, not people I knew well, but really smart people who would call my dad when they were in trouble or needed advice or, you know, um, I mean, Ted Kennedy called my father from the phone booth the morning after Chappaquiddick, um, 
you know, uh, that was just as, as an example. By the way, my father said, go, go call the police. <laughs> It was pretty simple advice <laughs> right now. Um, and uh, so they, um, so, you know, going into politics as Frank Mankiewicz's son, that, that felt like a, that felt like too, too, uh, maybe too big a burden to, because I, you know, I, I sort of, the moment I, I had got some degree of success once you realize, you know, I'm never going to have the life or that my father had, I'm not, I can't be that big. I'm not going to be that successful. And I'm not that, I'm not smart like he is in, in that way. I mean, I'm not, he was just a, you know, he, there was a brilliance to him. And once you sort of reckon that like, you could still have a really happy, productive life and not do that. So I, I thought about sports for a long time, which I care still very passionately about ridiculously passionately about. And uh, my first TV job was in sports and, uh, and then when I went out to, to, do, to, you know, decide to, I had a job in Miami as a journalist. I, TV news is tough, as you know, as probably everybody knows. I mean, I, I was in local news and it just, I hated it. Uh, I mean, I liked the journalism part of it, but the stories were, were tough to tell. You know, you don't want, I didn't want to knock on a mom's door and, and get somebody from the family to talk about, you know, their kid had been killed in crossfire. I, I don't want to do that. And I was good at it, like good at getting them to talk. And, you know, if you don't come out and talk, we won't, you know, whatever. I just felt like, why am I here? How am I helping anything? I'm not, I'm sensationalizing the story and exploiting their loss. And I hated it. And that became that those couple of incidents became sort of symbolic of, and local news sucks. Come on. So I, I wanted to come out to LA and get into, you know, host a talk show. I like, you know, a game show, you know, or, and, and, and that led to TCM. <laughs> I got all these, you know, the, the beginning of it, like, oh, they only hired him because he's a Mankiewicz. And I'm like, if I wanted that, I would stayed in Washington and gone into politics. Like that's, that's where I could have cashed in on that. Um, and not that and I'm- how, some, how did you, how did you? I mean, how did it happen? Oh, I mean, it's just luck. That's how you get every job is that, you know, I mean, Larry, you know, as a uh, Branch Ricky who signed Jackie Robinson uh, said, you know, famously is one of my fat father's favorite quotes and mine too. You know, luck is the residue of design. So- the, you know, the, the, the design is you make yourself ready, right. And you take advantage of every opportunity. And then you hope that you get lucky once you only need one job, like one good job. So, I mean, I, I didn't get, I mean, I, I went like in auditions one for 177, but I'm a winner, right? Like you just got to get one. There were a lot of jobs I didn't get. Um, some I came close to getting most, you know, you don't even, you're eliminated in the in the first round but eventually tcm came and and it was just a this really weird set this is the luck part you know i i get nervous and so auditioning the process of trying to be a host of something or you know whether it's game show i'm not an actor but i the auditions that i went on were sort of similar to what actors go through you're in this sort of sterile room and you read for a casting director or maybe the producer and you know, if it was a game show, they always had these incredibly complicated rules that you either had to memorize, which I couldn't do, or you're reading it off a cue card, you know, and it's like, okay, there are two contestants. Welcome, Julie, you know, so Julie, you're up first. And if you get the right answer in either of four tries, that's one point each, but the last one's worth three, but Ben can steal one of them. And if he steals the first one, it's worth one, but two, but if he misses that, he'll lose a point. Then you could take the point and you're like, and you're just talking and you're like, this is terrible. Well, what is happening? Right. You know? But TCM at the time wanted to have a second host. Robert Osborne was the original host of the network. And nine years in, they wanted somebody on the weekends, which where we, we get a, a lot of people watch weekend days. And at that time, though, they wanted it to be a conversation between the host and somebody involved with whatever movies they were showing. If they could get the, if the director was alive or a star was alive, they'd do that, but they were thinking offspring. And, and so they had us come in, a bunch of people come in and watch uh, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai and, and, and John Sturgis's American remake, cowboy remake, Western remake, the Magnificent Seven uh, with Steve McQueen and Yul Brynner and, and just watch them and discuss those movies. So I watched the movies, which I'd seen, I think. Um, but I hadn't, you know, I didn't, it wasn't like they were really important to me, but I, I know how to watch a movie and, uh, and think about it. And so I did that. And then they kept putting me with everybody. Like they'd have me come back and 
they were like, you, you and Ben, you play the expert and now you're the host. And yeah, yeah. And, and I had me matching with person after person after person. I was like, oh, they like me. I'm doing okay. And it was this moment where you got to breathe and talk to people. And I did well. And then by the time I got called back for a second audition, like five weeks later or six weeks later, they'd given up on that idea because it'd be too hard to book. And it was just back to doing an intro. But if I hadn't had that first opportunity, if that hadn't been an idea that existed for 10 days, I, uh, you know, I don't know that I would have gotten past the first round in the first place. And so I did. And then I read a, you know, I came in and I read a teleprompter and I just read an intro that somebody else had written. And, you know, and then the guy I finished, the guy was like, wow, this is not your first barbecue. I remember the first time I'd heard somebody say that. Right. And I was like, no, I, I've been reading for a long time, you know, <laughs> and I know how to read aloud. You know, I was, been, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it seemed so silly that they were so impressed that I was able to read allowed uh but you know it worked and i got the job and i thought it was a job in 2003 and now it's a career like it's a defining career it's 20 19 years and i hope you know at least 19 more you know i don't know why anyone would ever leave the only job in television where they're like when is your hair gonna turn white like we, we need a little gray yeah can you please get older yeah so uh i like it well i gotta say that you know, what you were saying before, how hard is it to ask people questions or read whatever you just said? And it's, uh, it's really hard. And I know that when, when we did promos for season two of the plot thickens, and we'll talk about the plot thickens in a little bit, it was really incredible for me to watch you work in front of camera. We were doing these promos. I had to go to Atlanta and all of a sudden I thought, this is really hard. You know, it's, it's, Look, I'm a print person, so usually cameras aren't on me when I'm doing anything. But what you did, and I had watched before we did that, you were doing some of the intros and outros for different movies. And it's actually one of the questions that somebody asked in the chat, too, which is about those intros and outros. So I think what would be really interesting, especially because you live in L.A. and you go to Atlanta to film those intros and outros just tell us what your work week is like and how do you do it and how do you prepare for all that for, for, for everything you're doing because it's a lot of movies to have to know something about or fake something about how, do, how does it work um well uh this was when i got this job and i was doing saturday and sundays during the day and they you know and, and partially Robert, who I, I eventually became close with, but he, and he wasn't like super happy when I came aboard, I don't think. And, uh, and so they had to, I was described always as the weekend daytime host. And every time I'd even try and tell them, can I just, could you say wait, weekend host? And I'd be like, no, nah, Robert <laughs> insists on weekend daytime. Like they were very, um, but it was, you know, and to me it was more money than I'd ever made. And it was, you know, not a lot of money, but it was good. And it was certainly, I was, I had not worked for 19 months after I came out to LA and my job in Miami went away. And, and so it was great, you know, <laughs> like, and, uh, um, but it was really a pretty easy job. You know, you go to Atlanta and then I was going every other month in the beginning and, you know, doing these intros and I was afraid to change a word that was written, you know, uh, unless it was, you know, it was a glaring error or something that I really couldn't say. Um, and, and now, I mean, my friends still don't believe me, but I mean, I, now I work harder than any of my friends, right. Who have regular jobs. And, uh, so, and I still don't think part of it is hard. Like it's not hard to, to tell stories, but it obviously on, on camera and, and read a teleprompter, but it is a skill because now I've seen all these talented actors come in and they, they're terrible. Right. You know, and, and so, yeah, it's a skill. Uh, to not sound like you're doing news anymore, which is sort of how I was trained, but to be able to be conversational and tell a story. And so, um, uh, and I, I basically like it. I mean, it's, you know, it gets repetitive. Yeah, we'd never repeat a lead in, you know, everything, every time you see one of the hosts on TCM, it's a fresh uh, lead in intro and an outro at the end of the movie, uh, out introduction, <laughs> the, um, that great word. Um, and uh, so, and the overwhelming majority of my time is spent um, doing those scripts. Uh, I mean, it just, you know, I got, I'm going next, uh, I could basically go every month. So I go to Atlanta for a week and we record 
for four or five days. And I'm, I'm going again the week of April 11th. Um, and, you know, I got, I think there's 67 scripts that we're going to do there. I don't think I have an interview, but that may change. Um, and I got to take all those scripts. They get sent to me. They're written by other people, but not, so I, they do as good as they can. Some are better than others, but every script takes me 40 minutes to rewrite basically on that's about the average 30 to 40 minutes so you know you do 70 of them like that's that's a 40 to 50 hours of just the actual work let alone the fact that i cannot do more than three in a row like because it's just and it, you know and, it, and then it goes away it like lives in the ether for two minutes and then it's gone you know so but i i like that process I li i'm a good editor and uh and i uh um you know and i end up rewriting a bunch of them almost entirely. Um, but it's tough because you'd have to, you know, if you, if I were going to write them all originally, you got to go through stacks of research, decide which story to tell this time. I mean, it would, there isn't time. So, I mean, in fact, it's not like we have one writer, we have about eight different writers and they all do little pieces and send in. Um, and as I've grown into the job and aged into it, I've sort of got things that I, you know, just little manners of phrasing things that I want people to stick to. So I don't have to change that. But, you know, I sit there and I yell and I'm like little things like, uh, you know, how do we have a writer who doesn't know that the comma goes inside the quote marks, <laughs> right? Little, little things that drive me <laughs> insane. Like you're a writer. Um, but uh, some of them are very good. And, uh, and so it feels really collaborative. Uh, and then it's my job to sort of, you know, uh, you know, and then I do 70 intros over three days. Right. We do about 22 a day. Some day we, we had a day where I did where I did uh, 37 fresh movies. So 74 in a day. That was uh, um, and, you know, they end up just running together. And I remember that, you know, instantly. So people are always asking me about, you know, they'll give me a movie that they care about deeply. Right. You know, and and but they know everything about that movie. And I'm like, you know, I've seen uh, I don't know, like uh, 3000 movies in the last 19 years. And they, they, they run together uh, and I'll need a little refresher before you're going to debrief me on, on uh, you know, why Edward G. Robinson uh, didn't respond in this moment uh, to Orson Welles. I'm like, I, I don't remember. I, <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to check. Um, but it's great. That said, it is the, I can't, I still can't believe I have this job because of the impact that the job has on the people who care about these movies, right? It means something to them. And that that is unbelievably uh, worthwhile. And real quick about my work, I'm leaving out when I have to do an interview, which is what takes, then I'm watching every single movie that, that you know, when you came on, I of course watched or rewatched, I think a couple, one or two other De Palma movies I, I hadn't seen. And you have to read about it and read about you and, and seem at ease with, you know, and seem like I'm the biggest Julie Solomon expert there ever was. Right. Um, yeah. uh, and so that's a, that's its own challenge. Uh, and, and I wish more of the information that I put into my head before I do an interview stayed, but it kind of doesn't. And I'm sure you've probably found that too. Right. Like you make your I made myself a Michael Douglas expert before we did a two and a half hour interview that became an hour long TV special. I mean, I knew everything. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about Michael Douglas now. Like I've already it just it, 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 I would need to rewatch my own interview to remind myself of all the things that I at one point knew about Michael Douglas. Well, that's one of the things I, I was thinking about, just even in that little window I had into your world. You know, I was a film critic for many years. And so you see a couple movies. So, I mean, I felt like I saw a lot of movies, but you see an insane amount of movies. And, you know, I think um, that to me feels like the heart. So I guess you're also an actor to a certain extent because you have to get, you have to be, involved in all these movies as respect, I guess, for the people who want right. to see them. You can't possibly like, like all of those movies. And yet you, your job is to be, how much are you aware of the people watching the show? And I have to say for me, learning about the TCM, uh, you know, the TCM world for lack of a better, if you could just even talk about that. And then while you're yeah. talking about TCM world, talk about how you met your wife. Cause I think you oh, mentioned sure. that that was, and it's such a good story. So, um, TCM yeah, so, so TCM, 
you know, there's, uh, I, I came up with this line when I was talking to the press like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, you know, about our first festival or something. And I, and so I always think of it like, oh, this is the cheesy line I give to the media, but it's just true. Well, first of all, there's a sense that I am an actor. Look, first, and one thing that's great about podcasts, which I know we'll get to, is that everything's different when you don't have a camera. It just is. And when the camera's on and the lights are on, and makeup, and then again, the clothes, you're putting on a suit, it's just different. It changes the nature and it, it instantly, uh, you know, uh, uh, here, I'll make up a word. It, it, it uh, de-authenticates everything, right? Like, like the, and that's what I crave in television. It's why I hated local news. My, this is my local news impersonations, me anchoring. And I would say, let's pretend, Julie, you're the, the doing weather. And I'll be like, hey, Julie Solomon is uh, here with the weather. <laughs> What's our Sunday looking like, Julie? And I would hear, why am I laughing? Why am I fake laughing? It's not funny. I'm just asking you. And why am I calling it our Sunday? It's just Sunday, right? But this is the thing TV people do. You would never say to your family, how's our Sunday looking? Like, you'd just be like, what are we doing Sunday? What's the weather Sunday, right? But you can't. There's this, it breeds inauthenticity. Um, and so everything I try to do is to make it as authentic as possible. So I, I learned at the last journalism job I had in Miami, which was a great place, which is worth talking about if we have time, um, is uh, that I'm really only good on air being myself. And that show afforded me and TCM has afforded that. It still is weird because you, again, makeup, clothes, lights, you're talking to a camera. It is not all the consultants who come and say, pretend you know, you're not talking to a person, you're talking to a camera. So you have to, it's just different. So I, I guess I, there is some acting involved, but I really feel like if I'm not the only thing I, I'm, I, I'm terrible at being a, any, I'm a terrible actor and I'm only good at being myself. And thankfully I found a job that allows that to happen. Um, so the thing about TCM is there's no channel or the thing I tell the press, there's no, there's no channel like it on television. I mean, it, it, for people who love it, it is really part of what defines them. Not all of them, but many would say, you know, Oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm a grandmother. I, uh, I'm a pet lover. I'm an accountant and I love TCM. Like that is not, you know, I love classic movies at a bare minimum. Right. I mean, it's sort of, it's part of their thing. And so no one in the history of the world has ever said these words. Oh my God, I love ABC, right? I mean, it's <laughs> ludicrous, right? It's just crazy. No one even says I love HBO, right? You know, you, you like shows. I love HBO because there are always three or four shows that I think are wonderful, right? And the three best shows ever, Sopranos, The Wire, Deadwood, and maybe the four best shows ever, if you count Succession, <laughs> and maybe even Game of Thrones, maybe the five best shows ever were on HBO, <laughs> right? But the but HBO, I don't love HBO. That's just the channel, right? But TCM, people love. It's woven into the fabric of their lives and who they are. And it means so much to them. And it does because it connects them to their roots. It connects them to their history. It connects them to their family's legacy. They watched these movies. Maybe they watched them with their father, their mother, their grandmother, or grandfather. Or they know or they didn't and they wish they had. And they know their dad loved John Wayne. Or they know their mom loved John Wayne, you know. And, you know, it was weird. My mom, and she was such a, 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 a dainty 50s housewife, but she loved Westerns, right? And so they, they identify with that. It connects them. So they sit around, they watch Westerns, and they think about their mom. So there's a big responsibility to take. And nobody else shows classic movies the, in the way we do. You can get them all, obviously, elsewhere. But we took on this responsibility the channel did when it went on the air in 1994 of being sort of the guardian, the protector of these movies and all these, these millions of people It's not most of the country, but it's a lot of people who care about these movies. were like, okay, great. Thank you for doing this. And now if you'll forgive me. I'm going to curse that don't fuck it up. Like if you're going to take this job, then take it seriously. So, so I feel that. And then, and so when we go through a change, whether we change the, font that we use for TCM or change my set or bring in a new host. It was certainly true when I came in in 2003, many of our fans are like, slow down. What are you doing? And, 
are you going to ruin the thing that the only thing on television I care about? I mean, the number of people say they only have TV at all because they want to watch TCM. Some people throw in, they're like, all I watch is CNN and TCM or all I watch is MSNBC or TCM or all I watch is Fox or TCM. I probably wouldn't get along with those people as well. But one of the great things about TCM is that it does do, it is a, it is a thing that literally brings people together. I don't want to overstate it and do a little kumbaya. And we're, you know, we're, 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 not, we're the United States of America, not the divided States of America, blah, 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 blah. It is nice that there is a thing that, that people who disagree about almost everything can come together to share an experience about. So I get recognized when I get rec I get recognized almost every day out in LA that I'm here. I don't always get approached, but whenever I get approached, it's just because people like they have this outpouring of goodwill toward the channel. I'm sure there are people who don't like me. Everybody on TV has people who doesn't like them, but it is nice that people respond to it so enthusiastically that they're so, they care about it so much. And to, to feel like you have a job in TV that it doesn't, that, that matters to people is so rare because TV is so stupid and so silly and it's filled with such junk. I love it, but that is also true that it's filled with all this crap and to be part of something that, that is special and, and matters deeply to a lot of people. Um, I just feel that's, that's luck to have stumbled into this. And then the, the design was to make them like me, you know, which is nice that it, it took a while. Cause by the way, my first three or four years, all your, I, I, I'd read the message boards. Yeah. And there were some, there were some people who were, <laughs> who were not happy with my arrival. Now you can read the chat here and there's a lot of people loving you and saying happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, me, me and my daughter, we have the same birthday, which is a, a lovely, and then, lovely and development. So tell, tell us about, how you met your wife. Oh yeah, so so TCM started a festival I guess and uh, we did 10 before the pandemic. So that would I think started first 2010 through 2019. Yeah, 10 festivals. Um and uh and my wife uh you know was like working in financial services in New York and and loved classic movies and tried to get some friends to come with her to the first TCM festival. And then she was going to go like, look at architecture in Palm Springs. She's an architecture buff. And, uh, and nobody would go with her, though, you know, cause there's all the great thing about TCM. The festival is bringing people together who think that they're the weird person at the office who likes classic movies and realizing that, Oh my God, here are thousands of people who are the weird people at the office who like old movies, who like black and white movies. So she came by herself. And I met her at the opening night party and she, you know, she's like some, somebody comes drags me over. This girl wants to meet you. And I was with my girlfriend at the time. And, and I, I see my wife and she puts her arms out like this. And she goes, she was, she'd had a little bit to drink and she goes, uh, Benny Mank. That was the first word she ever <laughs> said to me. Um, and we talked a bunch uh, that night and uh, my girlfriend and I gave her a ride and back to her, her hotel after the party. And I saw her, I think again on the last night and then, uh, and then at a TCM event, like five months later in Atlanta, a screening of the, the wizard of Oz, where they took out the, um, they removed the music and the Atlanta Philharmonic orchestra plays the music live during the movie. It's really cool if you ever get a chance to see something like that. Um, and because the orchestra needed a break, they created an intermission in the middle of Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, and she came backstage. She somehow got through that crack TCM security um, by walking backstage. And uh, and she said, hey, do you remember me? And I was like, I do. We met at the festival. Tell me your name again. That's not her favorite part of the story when I remind people that I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, and, and that sort of kicked off a you know, a long distance relationship of about a year and a half. And then she said, look, I'm going to move out to LA for three months. See how this goes. How do you feel about that? And I thought, sure. And she came out and it went well. And now we have a child. I love <laughs> that. I yeah. love that story. I love that story. So um, don't want to, we, we're going to go a little over, I think, because I have a couple of important things, but I do want to talk about the plot thickens because it's been a, 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 a new part of your work at TCM and I still have my TCM mug. From oh, when nice, I, nice. We got to get you one of the, got to get you one of the new ones. That's uh, old, that's, uh, that's, yeah. It's classic. It's a, <laughs> it's a classic TCM mug. That's right. So, so for those of you uh, watching today who don't 
know about it, the plot thickens is, well, Ben will tell you how it got started, but it's, it's a wonderful podcast series that I think really shows a difference or maybe not a different side, but an additional side of Ben, you know, the first, uh, the first season was about Peter Bogdanovich, and I thought that the depth and breadth of your interviews with Peter were extraordinary. Um, and so I just, if you would talk a little bit about how the idea got started, what made TCM decide to, you know, it's a, it's a movie channel, and all of a sudden you're doing something that's audio. Well, um, so there's the business part of it, which is that, you know, look, uh, I just I I remember you know when uh, T, uh, ESPN had some hosts who were you know took I thought really important and somewhat courageous stands during the social upheaval of the last uh, few years and uh, uh, you know starting with Colin Kaepernick and uh, uh, and continuing through 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 George Floyd and and. Uh, uh, and there was this reaction from the conservatives, you know, ESPN's losing viewers because they're getting political, you know, just stick to sports thing that conservatives always tell me, just stick to sports, right? Just stick to whatever, shut up and talk about movies, shut up and sing to Bruce Springsteen, shut up and whatever. No, don't. Right. So um, I, uh, I just remember thinking at the time, ESPN is losing viewers because they're on cable. They're losing the same viewers. They're not losing because Colin Kaepernick hosts are supporting Colin Kaepernick's decision to kneel before the national anthem. They're losing viewers because people are cutting the cord to cable because we're losing viewers and CNN's losing viewers and Fox News is losing viewers. Everybody's losing viewers, right? And so there has been for the last certainly five years, even longer, but this notion that you know, cable TV's, it, 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 there, there's probably a bottom. It, it's probably not going to go away entirely. But the, uh, you know, people are cutting the cord. But people watching here, I'm sure a bunch of them don't have cable. Whereas 10 years ago, almost everybody would have had cable. So TCM was trying to figure out a way to, because we have this now I'll talk like in the way that I hate, but we have a brand that matters, right? We have a brand that means something to people. So how do we use that to, grow this business while still being true to what we do, which is tell stories about movies and podcasting was, you know, and continues to be this giant growth industry. Um, and so I wanted to do a podcast. I wanted to do an interview podcast. I still do. <laughs> um, and that was my first uh, pitching to TCM about that. And they were already talking about doing a podcast and, and I had become real close to Peter at the festivals uh, and then we just became friends because it's really hard not to become friends with, with Peter. I was really nervous when I met him the first time, but I, he's, he was great. And I miss Peter him. Bogdanovich. Peter yeah. Bogdanovich. Yeah. And so I said, look, we should do podcasts with Peter. Cause he's this living link to classic Hollywood. And the idea I had was a really good one. Um, uh, and the idea that our head of podcast, Angela Caron had was a much better one. <laughs> And, uh, and so Angela was like, no, Peter's story in itself is compelling, not just Peter talking about other directors, which was really my idea because he's interviewed so many. Um, and then, you know, Peter really opened up in these interviews in, a, in an interesting way. There are a lot of ways for people to open up. And, and Peter's way was compelling. And he was willing to sort of examine his life. And he was pretty honest about the mistakes he's made. And there were a lot of them. And he's had this you know, he's had some he had one significant, horrible tragedy and then a couple of career disasters uh, and comebacks. But he never lost this enthusiasm for movies or, you know, loyalty to his friends, people he really cared about. Uh, and so we that became our first season of the plot thickens. Uh, you know, uh, I'm still Peter Bogdanovich and Devil's Candy was the second season and 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 Lucy uh, about Lucille Ball and, and her arc of her career and marriage to Desi, all that stuff was the third season, which we just finished. Um, and it's just, I like it because I like to be able to do these interviews and it's just a different form of, again, it's a different form of storytelling. It feels more authentic to me because I'm telling a story, right? I mean, you're, it, there's no camera. There's no, it makes a huge difference that you can dress like this every day that you can wear a hat that I don't have to shave. You know, uh, it just, and and the writing is different. And then I just learned so much more about this, you know, audio storytelling and 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 what these audio engineers, our audio engineer a guy named Mike Volgaris, man, what they can do 
is just make these things sing. I mean, it is, it's like producing an album, you know, I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, you, you, you get, you know, when you get a record producer who, who knows how to make the Beatles sound great, knows how to make the E street band sound great. You know, uh, the, you know, the band's great, but man, these guys who create the albums and that's what, and that's what these audio engineers can do. And, you know, I just remember reading stuff going like, Angela, this is awkward. I don't, this phrasing doesn't sound right. It's, it's certainly this transition won't work. It's too abrupt. And she's like, just, I got you. I hear you. You want to do it, try it a different way. Fine. But trust me, Mike will make this work. And then sure enough, <laughs> it's just, you know, it sounds like the most perfect thing there is. So I love it. We're hard at work already on our fourth season, uh, which I think will be out uh, in the fall. Um, and uh, I, I love it. I love being able to, to do this in addition to what we do at TCM. And I still want to do that. To, I just still do want to do a, 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 mo a, what would be mostly an interview podcast, maybe not entirely. What, what is season four about? Can you say yet? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Pam Greer, uh, uh, you know, who was a gargantuanly huge star for four or five years in the mid 70s I mean, big star throughout but but was a huge star and really that you know people think of what are called black exploitation films and you think first about shaft but but she was really the first black exploitation star um and uh and the black exploitation films uh what they did that was perhaps most important was uh, empowering women and you know and having women not need a guy but violently taking charge of their life to correct some injustice. And Pam was the, was the signature face of that. And, you know, had very meaningful relationships with uh, Freddie Prinz and Richard Pryor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, and, uh, and has an incredibly compelling family history prior to that and suffered through some unimaginable trauma and emerged from it. And then because she was, black a black black exploitation star and a woman who had the audacity to you know turn 30 <laughs> um and uh so she uh uh you know she never went away she kept working but stopped being a star and then quentin tarantino wrote jackie brown for her wow. right an adaptation of a elmore leonard novel called rum punch where the lead character was not black but tarantino envisioned that character as Pam Greer and wrote it for her. Uh, I mean, she wasn't even, not, I got it, not winning an Oscar or being nominated for an Oscar is nothing wrong with it, but that's the best performance of the year. It's one of the great, I, I couldn't love that movie more. And she's so magnificent in it. And it gave her this lovely second act, L word. And she's still, uh, you know, as she's sort of in a third act now. And uh, she's a really compelling figure. And the black exploitation, the history of black exploitation is a, uh, overlooked critical part of of American movie making in the seventies. So we'll 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 be getting into all of that on uh, on season four. Oh, it sounds great. I mean, I have to say, the Lucy, as I said before, I, I thought, oh, what can I learn about Lucy? And it was that it was fabulous. Um, Thank so you. So before we go, this is the American Jewish Historical Society, and I would like you a little bit to talk about your Jewish identity of if there is one, what, what, what is being of Jewish, being Jewish mean to you? Well, that's changed. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a terrible Jew. I'm very bad at it, but, but it does that mean. Makes you a, that makes you right, a Jew. Right that there. makes you a Jew. That's right. But I am, uh, so I didn't, you know, my brother, who I'm really close to, Josh Mankiewicz, was just the two of us. He's 12 years older than I am. Seems much older. Um, he, uh, you know, if you asked him if he's Jewish, he would say no. And if you asked me, I would say yes. And uh, our mom was not Jewish, but I defy you to find a more Jewish mother than my mother, who'd been a Mormon and then left the church as soon as she could at 18. Because at that point, they were not, you know, ordaining black priests and she had a very strong sense of social justice throughout her life. And she just recognized, she's like, this is ridiculous this is nonsense. None of these things happened. And you guys are acting like this happened in the 19th century. And the guy read into a hat that said he could sleep with 12 year olds. That's really how the, in some ways, how the religion was born. Right. And she wanted no part of it. Um, but she loved her family 
and and her family, you know, as they two generations, they're all still Mormon. They're most of them are not practicing, but some are, and they're the, like they're the they're so unbelievably kind and and lovely. So I don't want to stereotype Mormons. And my mom got very got her uh, dander up about when people would criticize Mitt Romney for being Mormon and say that he wasn't a Christian. And my mom was certainly not a supporter of Mitt Romney, but she was like, Mormons are, are Christians, and calling them not Christians, you're not paying any attention, right? You're not doing your work. And so, uh, but she left the church and then she married my father who was Jewish and, uh, and always said like, while she was an agnostic, she said, look, if you made me be pick a faith, I would be a reformed Jew because they question things and they take care of each other, which she always admired about Mormons. Certainly unbelievable, unquestionably true that, that Mormons look out for their neighbors as, as, as well as anybody else. And, and maybe more so really than almost every other faith. Um, and so, um, but then like, so I would say too, no, I wasn't Jewish. And I thought, you know, I knew so little and, the, you know, I, I bristled at the chosen people, literally that as a kid and into the young adulthood made me think, who calls themselves that kind of assholes call themselves the chosen people. And then I, you know, started wearing glasses all the time. And my last name is Mankiewicz. And I looked like this and I found myself saying to people, no, I'm not Jewish. You know, I mean, they don't want me and my mom's not Jewish. And then I don't know, almost in a, I don't know. I, I don't know whether there was a moment experiencing a little bit of anti-Semitism in the South. I was like, I think I'm being an ass. Like, this is not like my dad's Jewish, proud of it. If I'm anything, I'm Jewish. You know, I mean, I went to uh, high holiday, high holidays uh, with him to temple and, and what am I doing denying this? This is stupid. And, and, and I like it. And I don't have to believe who believes it, who believes anything, right? That's okay. This is not what this is about. And so should anyone ask me if I'm Jewish, my answer is, yeah, absolutely. Of course I'm Jewish. What kind of question is that? Why, what do you want to know? You know, like, uh, and, uh, I don't know. And I'm, I'm much more comfortable uh, with that. And then I start caring about, you know, culturally, reading more, understanding more, even, you know, my wife is trying to get us to, to, you know, go to this pop-up temple in Venice, this really progressive, you know, and I, and, and I'm, and she's not Jewish, you know, but she's like, she's like, I'll convert. And I'm like, I'll leave you if you convert. No one's allowed to convert to anything. You can, we can all go to temple if you want, but nobody converts, just take a deep breath. Um, and I don't let my daughter, I let my, make sure my daughter knows, you know, you know, when she's said, even at age, she's eight until tomorrow, you know, when she says, um, um, well, I'm telling you, know, I'm, I'm half, you know, Catholic and half Jewish and, and I'll go, okay, I know. I, I just want you to know your name's Josie Mankiewicz and you're my daughter and this is your last name and this is how you look. You're Jewish. Just get comfortable with it. You can believe whatever you want. You can run your life however you want, but you're Jewish and don't forget it. And it's sticking. So it's nice. I, I literally can't believe I have those conversations, but I, but uh, I have, so I've, I've grown, I'm still terrible, but I've definitely uh, grown into it. Well, you are far from terrible. I, I can't believe we're at the end of this time. You, this has been so great, Ben. Really appreciate it. In uh, fact, we're going to do it again in three hours. When it, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I'm sorry for uh, putting you guys through some stress when you didn't know where I was. I was just literally driving around my house talking to a friend. I was doing laps around the house. Um, uh, so uh, um, I'm ha happy to do it. I, I could go on forever. So thanks, Julie. It's lovely as always to talk to you. And season two, uh, real quick. Uh, so I was at, uh, do a little name dropping. I was at uh, Francis Ford Coppola. I got a star on the Walk of Fame uh, this week. And and uh uh, I was there. Um, it was lovely. And Francis and I were going to, that, that's hopefully in the, our podcasting future. Um, and uh, that we've had, a, we, I got to meet him and got to know him over the last year and a half. And it's, he's, as you might imagine, great. And as no, is so smart. But anyway, we're at this walk of fame ceremony, which is always a little cheesy because it's, well, he, there, he didn't care whether he has it, but Paramount 50th anniversary of the Godfather, they're paying for it. By the way, everybody has a star on the walk of fame costs money a lot of money. So Paramount's, <laughs> Paramount's given it to him and he agreed to do it to help with the promotion of the re-release of The Godfather turning 50. So, but inside his nephew, Talia Shire's son, Jason Schwartzman, filmmaker, I'm kind of anxious to meet him, nervous. He goes, oh my God, I've been waiting to meet you. Yeah, I love your work, which is always like, 
I just talk about other people's movies. You make movies, right? And so I tell him what a fan I am of his movies. And, and he says, listen, I, I've just listened to the podcast uh, multiple times. The plot thickens. It's really great. And I, you know, I go, oh, oh, which, which season? He goes, all three seasons, right? And I go, you've listened to all three seasons multiple times. You don't need it. And, and his wife goes, no, no. He has, he goes, you know, I started with Peter and then the devil's candy and I just finished Lucy. And then he goes, I mean, I just read the devil's candy. Like I read it like nine months before the podcast comes and I've now listened to it twice. And I can't believe Julie had these interviews in it. Oh my God. It's such a great movie book and the podcast made it even better. And it just came. So Jason Schwartzman was just talking about his love <laughs> of, uh, of Julie Solomon. So uh, uh, multiple listens from a very yeah. talented filmmaker. Well, wow, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Of course. Take care all and have a good afternoon.